Join us in the Weekender on 6255 1206. The Canberra Weekender on 2CC. 27 and a half minutes past 10. The number if you want to give us a call this morning, 6255 1206. If you want to text us, 0488 266 266. Or you can email us too. Head to 2CC.net.au and click on the feedback, feedback icon. Stephen Senatiempo in the chair this morning for the Canberra Weekender. On the Canberra Weekender, Tech Talk with Alex saharov Royt. He is the editor of techadvice.life. Alex saharov Royt, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Uh, we actually have a, uh, a third wheel this morning. We do, We yes. do. Uh, joining us on the line is Dr Natalia Ilyushina, or Dr Pink, as she's known. Natalia, good morning. Good morning. There's been a, a lot of AI news around this week. Um, well, there's a lot of AI news around all the time Every, now. T- every week. Yeah. And I think we saw it... Um, I don't know if you saw the... Re- well, every, most people saw the presidential debate in the United States. Mm-hmm. It was an absolute train wreck. Oh, yeah. There's now a suggestion from some Democratic insiders that what, um, because, you know, Donald Trump is the devil and if he comes back to power, the whole world will end. So they're actually encouraging people to alter clips of Joe Biden with using AI and post them on the Internet (laughs) to show everybody that, no, Joe's okay. I mean, oh, yeah, I've seen lots of them. <laughs> they, a... they don't look okay either way. <laughs> well, I, I remember joking that uh, if, the, if you had a, a deep fake of Donald Trump, you know, you wouldn't know. But if it was a deep fake of Biden, you would know because he would seem uh, like he was fully with it. And that's just not the case. <laughs> now, uh, one thing I am interested in, uh, Natalia, you are going to be presenting um, at a conference here in Canberra in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, something yeah. I used to have, it's called Tech in Government these days. Back when I was involved with it, it was called um, Government, Government ICT. ICT, I think, yeah. was the name of the, uh, the back. The, this is back before AI even existed. Um, talk us through how AI is going to play a, a role in government, because I've got to say that scares me when I say it out loud. Well, that scares me that the government doesn't understand that AI and digital transformation is there. That's the main issue. So I've, uh, it's my second time at second government. So last year I was there and the keynote, uh, opening keynote speech was by, delivered by Bill Shorten and it was called Digital Transformation for Australia, something along the lines. And what really concerned me that all he was talking about was digital ID and he presented digital ID as a whole stack of digital transformation and digital infrastructure that we have and that's what he thinks that that's it, that's the end of it. Um, in fact, what we are seeing is, uh, you know, we, we becoming um, increasingly um, looking like backwards country, especially in terms of cybersecurity, because we don't have a digital infrastructure for uh, digital safety and security, and it's not enabling any sort of developments in AI at the moment. But Alex, cyber security is one thing, and that's something mm. we obviously need to invest in. But I have a, a philosophical problem with the concept of artificial intelligence in general. I mean, well, I like to, you know, there's this big building up on the hill there in Canberra that's got plenty of artificial intelligence in it already, but <laughs> that's, that's not the point. But I, I just feel like we're dumbing ourselves down by getting computers to think for us now. Yeah, well, uh, look, the thing is that the current AI that we have, uh, it's very impressive, but it's very primitive compared to what artificial general intelligence, which uh, Mayor Sashi Sun, the, the head of SoftBank, said that we would see within uh, you know, four or five years, one to ten times uh, you know, general intelligence, one to ten times smarter than humans. But he reckons by 2035, it'll be 10,000 times smarter than a human. That's artificial super intelligence. And he and the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, are warning us, watch out. Natalia, one of my biggest concerns is is that okay, even if all, even if artificial intelligence has all the potential we think it's going to have, it's going to be controlled by the likes of Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and Sam Altman and these kind of power, uh, these kind of people. Are, are they really the kind of people? I mean, they got way too much power as mm. it is now. They they are they are. That's where the concern. So the technology itself is helpful, but the, the, the three these three people who are standing behind it are the ones who we should be worried about. I did actually attend a Sam Altman's talk in Melbourne uh, last year, and um, the start of his talk was pretty plain, not much emotions, and it's pretty standard things about how, no, AI is good for us. And then somebody in the audience did ask him, uh, Sam, if you bundle up together with Elon, would you take over the world? And his eyes lit up. He, he, he started talking. He started being real himself. 
So I'm pretty sure that these three are actually nurturing the idea of ruling the world. And what's worse, they they are in charge in the technology that can enable it. Well, I can give you an example of that. Four hours ago, Joe Biden tweeted this. Let me say this as clearly as I can. I'm the sitting president of the United States. I'm the nominee for the Democratic Party. I'm staying in the race. That was clearly written by AI. (laughs) You can see my point here about why I'm worried about this. Well, maybe AI is doing a better job for Joe Biden, but I wouldn't want AI replacing our politicians because with the energy prices, we're pretty safe. <laughs> well, that's the thing. There are a number of uh, data centers that are doing trying to do deals in the US and in Europe with nuclear facilities, so they have enough power. In Australia, we can't decide whether we want a nuclear reactor or not. Oh, yeah, well, we, we cannot decide. Well, Labor is deciding for us. Don't worry about that. Maybe that's why they want a renewable, so that power is expensive, so they cannot be replaced by AI. <laughs> well, actually, one of the things I saw this week was in Japan. They had these humanoid robots, giant robots, and they were used to uh, efficiently repair the train lines and the power lines in Japan. And I thought to myself, wow, these huge, hulking, giant AI humanoid robots, we need a few of them in Canberra. They might do a better job of governing than, than the lot we've got there now. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Um, the look. Let's talk, let's talk seriously about this, though. There is a concern that AI will start to take people's jobs. I mean, and if, and if it works um, the way it's supposed to, it well, I guess it has to, doesn't it? Uh, look, uh, in, y- yes and no. First of all, um, generative AI, well, which is Chad Chad GPT, that is known in the wider circle circles. Um, it's been around for almost two years now, and have you seen anybody who's, who lost job directly from that? I haven't. Um, there are job cards that being broadcasted that they try to attribute it to somehow to AI. Uh, say KPMG done two or 300 job cards because they're transforming their consultancy towards technology. But that's, that sort of process is structural changes in the economy that are going, uh, happening all the time. And AI, it's, uh, it, what, what it does, it augments, um, ma- namely it complements the human labor, so it may improve the efficiency and productivity. Exactly what we need in Australia, rather than actually taking over the whole job from start to end. Well, I was reading uh, one particular article that was saying that uh, AI is not going to take your jobs. It's going to be employers using AI to uh, lower their costs and uh, get rid of support people, get rid of uh, people in uh, in the call centres because the AI can do such a a good job. There's this uh, report by Vodafone using this system called Toby Mm. overseas, not even in English. They've got it in 13 different languages and it's so much more efficient at answering people's questions, deep uh, tech support questions that they have, they're looking forward to rolling that out globally. Yeah, but see, this this is my concern in that, you know, I mean, let's look, for instance, at um, things like the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, Centrelink, uh, Veterans Affairs. The problem with these things is is that we've got humans there that should be able to think rationally and laterally who aren't able to help the people they're there supposedly to help. Uh, I, AI is only going to be limited by, is always going to be limited by the people who are, I guess, feeding the information to it or setting the parameters of these things. So Garbage in, garbage out. Exactly. And it's going to be those same people that are providing garbage now mm that are teaching the AI. So, I, you know, um, there, there are some things that a human is always going to be able to do that a computer will never be able to do um, because of, you know, I mean, there's emotion involved. There's, yeah. there's the, the human reality of that. Um, that's where I have a real, a real concern that there is, a, I guess, a bridge that AI can never cross. So what what you uh, touched upon is very important, garbage in, garbage out. And the it's not even to do with AI that government services are failing to adopt technology. They failed with robot debt. That was before generative AI. So mm. there is a structural problem in the way how technology and adopt is coming from the government department. So no matter what technology you give them, they're going to mess it up, basically, to yep. put it simply. But, but Well, that's but that's the point. Can I just say, that, that's, that's yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. Because robo-debt in and of itself, the concept wasn't wrong. It was the execution that was wrong. Yeah. And robot debt was it was actually a great idea, and the, the, there is a problem across all the services that the customer facing, all government services that customer facing, they're incredibly understaffed. Like say, you cannot 
possibly get through to Central Inco Services Australia. Nobody picking up the phone right now. Mm. So we we need some sort of help because I don't know why, but they cannot employ enough staff, and even with the budgets that they have. So, but to your point, it's somebody else needs to design it. So if Vodafone is capable of uh, employing good enough technology to provide good and sufficiently good customer service, why cannot NDIS or Services Australia do the same? So that's a question to the government and their their strategy of technology adoption overall. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic. We're in conversation with Alex Zaharov Royt from TechAdvice.life and Dr. Natalia Ilyushina. Dr. Pink, we're going to take a short break and we'll continue this discussion about tech. 6255-1206 is the number if you want to join us. It is 22 minutes to 11. on the Canberra Weekend. To Stephen Senatiempo with you this morning. We're talking to Alex Zaharov Royt from techadvice.life and uh, we're also joined by Dr Natalia Ulyushina. Um, we're talking AI this morning. Um, Natalia, Ed Husick is the Federal Minister for Innovation these days and there was an AI regulation inquiry that you contributed to about a year ago. Has anything come out of it? Uh, no, nothing yet. And that's, again, another concerning thing, again coming from the government. Um, so I contributed to the first inquiry uh, in about June last year as a part of the um, uh, Automated Decision Making and Society Centre. I was part on at the time, part of at the time. Uh, then in January, Ed Husik said there's going to be a second round of inquiry contributions uh, and consultations. So instead of delivering some sort of results, he delivered that, no, we need to consult more. While European Parliament, European Union Parliament, by that time, they already had final drafts of AI, responsible AI legislation. That was passed and adopted um, in March this year. So I'm not sure what, 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 at what stage the inquiry is now, because it's all quiet. Um, and it's pretty much, we're not going anywhere. And what's concerning, again, what's concerning about it, if without legislation, we cannot enable adoption and um, effective functioning of the businesses because no one knows what's right, what's wrong, what's ethical, what's safe, what's responsible, what's not. Yeah, okay. Um, that, well, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, there, there's uh, <laughs> the inquiry after inquiry after inquiry, and we never seen anything yeah. out of it. Uh, what about the? We talked about the, I guess the the three billionaires that are leading the charge here. Is there likelihood that there's going to be an AI, like a dot-com style boom in AI that then leads to a crash and then leads to a, I guess, finally to a rationalisation of the industry that kind of settles things down a bit? Are we, uh, is that what we're headed towards? Uh, not at this stage. The way AI functioning now is quite different to what happened with the dot-com boom because there we had just had a simple um, uh, setup where the share price went to too high compared to the actual asset value, which is not is not even specific to dot com uh, industry. It happens from time to time in, in different industries. But what's happening with the AI, um, the value uh, that it delivers is still a lot higher compared to the price that we're paying. So unless uh, uh, Sam Altman wakes up tomorrow and starts charging us a thousand bucks for a chat GPT subscription. We're quite far away from a dot-com style bubble burst. We also have the issue that uh, AI is uh, always being talked about in ethical terms. You know, they're building AI ethically. But uh, Sam Altman uh, descri- disclosed that there was a, a hack uh, of OpenAI a year ago that uh, was for internal messaging systems. The hacker wasn't from a nation state and only looked at uh, internal messaging systems. But then we also have the news that uh, the ChatGPT app for the Mac was storing your chats, the ones that you know you ask ChatGPT questions about, in plain text. I mean, they've since put out an update that uh, encrypts it all. But I mean, there's still serious questions about just how seriously uh, these companies are taking the ethical side of things that uh, they might lose control. And then, you know, AI decides to go all Skynet on us and uh, shut us all out. Well, it's uh, ethical and not. You, uh, if you read terms and conditions, you're well aware. And because with that um, uh, startup business I'm doing, we do educate all the time saying, you know, everything you put into chat GPT goes straight to open AI and they can read it. 
but there's lots of solutions, enterprise solutions right now, where they just put encryption in between the your AI tool interface and what's actually getting to open AI. So it's um, it, it's we're getting there. These problems are being addressed, and yes, it is unethical. But if you, uh, as with any app or software, you 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 are given those terms and conditions that you haven't read. As usual. <laughs> now, Natalia, before we let you go, um, I mentioned earlier you were going to be speaking at the Tech and Government yeah. Conference here in Canberra on the 23rd and 24th of July. You've got your own stand there for your business. Um, yeah. Tell us, so Tech Fem Fusion, tell us about that. Uh, it's a startup that um, uh, got brought about my research uh, that, well, research that didn't end up into any fruition because what we found out when we were trying to understand the impact of, of automation and AI on businesses and skills, we realized that businesses do not know that they're using them while they are using automation and AI and digital tools. And that's basically a consultancy that provides training and explanation to businesses where, they, where they're already using AI so that they know the threats and all the cyber security side, the data, um, um, data safety issues. And, and Natalia, and, yeah, you, were, the, you were telling me that you were a keynote speaker at the Bigger Canning Expo last month in Melbourne. And when you were giving your talk, when you, you noticed that the audience, their eyes really lit up when you said that your employees are using AI without yeah. you even knowing it. What's the very short yeah. story there? Yeah, and that's that's literally that. My my um, panel was the last panel of the conference, so the, the you know the one after people had already had their conference dinner the night before, and <laughs> that's why I was so surprised that they uh, when they heard uh, my message that you know your employees all are using that AI tools to improve their productivity, and then I highlighted all the um, risks and threats, including uh, that their customer data can go God knows where. And that's when, um, yeah, that's when- People's eyes lit up. Yeah, they're like, oh my God. Because what's going on, many small business owners, especially on the older generation, they just say, no, we can continue doing business without adopting uh, AI. But they, they they don't realize that it's not up to them anymore. It's not their choice anymore. It's there. It's, it's they it just crawled into their business and doing whatever it wants at the moment. All right, before you depress me anymore, I'm going to let you go, <laughs> Doctor Natalia Ulyashina. <laughs> thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thanks for having me, uh, Doctor Pink, as she's otherwise known. Uh, now, Alex, you've got some details on the Tech and Government um, 24, 2024 conference on your website. Yeah, I'll have it there on my site, and uh, people can uh, still register to go. And the exhibition floor itself, where they have all these various companies that working with business and government, that's free. But if you want to go to the actual conference, two days of a conference as well, I'll be yep. um, uh, moderating two sessions. One is the one with Natalia and her RMIT colleague on the 24th. But on the 23rd, there's a session about uh, improvements in government service delivery. And look, I'm not an expert in that, but I'm a recipient of those. And so I'll be very curious to see what those guys are going to talk about. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, we're talking to Alex Zaharov Royd. He's the editor of techadvice.life. It is 11 minutes to 11. Everything Canberra for your weekend. Call 6255-1206. This is the Canberra Weekender on 2CC. It's uh, 8 minutes to 11. Uh, Alex Zaharov, Roy, the editor of techadvice.life, is with us this morning. Uh, we've been talking about AI, Alex, but uh, let's talk about radio. Commercial Radio and Audio Australia um, has launched its inf Infinite Dial Report for 2024, which tells me what I already knew is that everybody still listens to radio, despite the fact that people will tell you, oh, I don't listen to the radio anymore, but everyone else does. I oh, know radio uh, reaches 81% of the population in yep. Australia. You've got strong engagement across all the def demographics. They're saying that the reach is 27% higher than in the US. So mm. we've got a strong radio culture here. And they say that eight in 10 Australians aged 12 plus are tuning in weekly. So it's definitely remaining a, sta a staple. Now, you do also have um, uh, ad support supported audio like Spotify, but it says that Aussies prefer listening to radio over these ad-supported streaming services. Well, it, now, people listen, people probably don't know, I, I guess, explicitly why they listen to the radio. Subconsciously, they do. But there's one thing we can do on the radio that other mediums can't do, mm. other media can't Immedi do. Immediacy, right? Immediacy is the first thing. Mm. And personal connection. Yeah. So talk our listeners can actually talk to us 
in real time. Yeah. You can't do that with any other media. No, I mean, Paul Murray did try it for a while with uh, his show on, on Sky, but yeah. uh, that was three or four years ago and it hasn't come back. No, no. It's And, and I think, you know, it, it's that block. People understand that if you ring me on the – it's like a conversation on the telephone. Yeah. When you're ringing a TV station – you, you kind of it's hard to get your head around that you're doing the same thing and that's yeah. you know I don't think it works and look the other thing these days I mean it used to be that you had a radio in the car you're listening and you had to go to get some fuel or walk into a store and you would lose that connection now we did always have portable walkmans and things but you know people weren't listening to the radio as they got out of the car now you've got the airpods on you can have it listening in the car you can switch across to your earbuds and uh, so streaming uh, is has grown notably especially among 25 to 54 year olds and also podcasts have, have risen in popularity as well because you can tune in and tune out whenever you want if you've got mm. some time to listen you can pause come back a couple of hours later keep going where you left off you can't do that with live radio in the same way you can with the podcast version of your show yeah, having said that, though, I, I don't listen to podcasts. I've, I've never really listened to one. But um, it's interesting you say the, the when you talk about the delivery methods because I am, a, as a radio junkie, and I've been a radio junkie since I was five years old, mm. I listen exclusively now um, uh, via digital streaming. So yeah. I, at home I've got a number of Alexa speakers around the house. So I've got one in the bedroom, one in the lounge room, one in the bathroom, and I've constantly got the radio on, yeah. on 2 C, of course. Alexa, yeah. play 2 C. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and Alexa's across camera yeah, yeah, turning on. Right. <laughs> I do the same in the car too. Yeah. I, um, you know, I plug my phone in to Android Auto and listen via the radio app, which with CRA actually has its own app where you can listen to any radio yeah. station. Yeah, that's the radio app. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. So um, it's... Um, you know, the, the, a lot of people have always said this next thing is going to kill radio. What they don't realise is the important yeah. thing about radio is what I'm doing now, talking into the microphone. Everything else is kind of a subsidiary. Yeah. You know, so the delivery methods and all of those kind of things can change, and, and they obviously have. Well, we've got uh, in-car audio streaming. Listening rates are 75% ha higher than the next closest audio source. So what that means is that people are actually in their cars, they're streaming uh, 2CC or whatever the station is because they're getting a better quality of audio. You yeah. know, it's, it's better than FM. And uh, also, like digital audio broadcast handheld radios. I mean, they're great and everything, but your phone does exactly the same job. Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't chew up batteries like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, that's and, and that's an important point. And, and smart Smart speaker adoption, uh, particularly um, in the US, is huge. But in Australia, it's starting to, you know, and, and different cohorts too. I mean, people think it's technology for young people, but a lot of older people are starting to realise now for the sake of 50 bucks, you go and buy one of the, whatever the small Amazon speaker yeah, is. Or the Google on. Nest or whatever yeah, it is, yeah. You know, and stick it in your house. Everyone's got Wi-Fi. Yeah. And it, it does whatever you want it to do. Yeah, look, 55% uh, have used in Australia their devices, their smart speakers to listen to audio in the past month. So there's a significant shift towards smart connected audio experiences. And look, there was a leak this week that Apple is going to have a uh, HomePod with a TV screen, like an iPad, yep. but it'll be running the TV OS operating system, which does all the streaming TV and audio yeah, and yeah. has all those things. So it's only once Apple comes along with their device, wow, it's going to ev explode even further. Well, but having said that, Amazon and Google have been doing that for ages. They, they for have, ages. Yeah, they have yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's just going to be yet another player in there that's going yeah. to, lifting tide, a rising tide lifts all boats. Now, we've only quickly got a minute left. Uh, next week, Samsung are launching their latest Fold and Flip phones. Um, um, that's going to be, well, they seem to be, look, I, I haven't, I'm a Samsung user. Yeah. I haven't gone to the Folds and the Flips yet, but it seems to be a burgeoning uh, marketplace. Oh, absolutely. And uh, these new devices are promising to be sleeker and slimmer. They're going to have a, a even uh, more imperceptible crease in the middle. And uh, obviously, we'll have even more AI features than they launched with the Samsung Galaxy S24, especially around things like uh, uh, translation and, and rewriting your um, information for you, you know, helping you with emails, uh, creating images. It's There's going to be lots about it next Wednesday. I think 11 p.m. you can watch it live. Uh, otherwise, just watch it on YouTube anytime. Well, and Alex will be back next Saturday and he'll probably talk more about that yes. and um techadvice.life you've got a tv show on there give yep. us a quick plug before 6 p.m with uh, jeff schomberg he's going to talk about pass keys and physical security keys so that you can't have your account easily taken over by the bad guys good on you alex we'll catch up next time talk to you then alex sahara of Royt from techadvice.life